Hello and welcome to the Wisden Cricket Weekly podcast in association with Charles Tirrett. Another fantastic test to remember as England sealed just their third ever series win in Pakistan. Speaking of good things, with Christmas just around the corner, if, like ourselves, you haven't quite done all your Christmas shopping yet, then look no further. Our friends at Charles Tirrett have all your gifting needs covered. Need some knitwear, maybe some luscious cashmere, a shirt or a polo or a little something for a stocking filler like a pair of socks or some boxers? Then either go online to charlestirrett.com or visit one of their stores. I think I could do with one of their scarves after the snow we've had overnight. Um, as always, Charles Tirrett have got our backs. Don't forget to use the code WISDON22 to get 20% off. Charles Tirrett would also like to congratulate their brand partner, Joe Root, for becoming only the third ever cricketer to score over 10,000 Test match runs and pick up 50 wickets in the Test game. Anyway. I mean, he's third. Yeah, only Who are the third. other two? Um, Callis. Work it out. I know the other one. Can you get it? Oh, I mean, it's Monday morning. Just to tell me. <laughs> Steve Waugh. Steve Waugh? Mm. Of course, yeah. Anyway, on with the show. England had only ever won two tests in their history in Pakistan before this tour. Now they've won two in the space of 11 days. I'm Yaz Rana and with me today is Phil Walker and Ben Garner who've both um, valiantly battled through icy conditions to get to the office. Uh, but first, let's go to Mark Butcher to hear his thoughts on the test. Mark, on the Ben Stokes, England have been very good at taking 20 wickets across a test match. Um, England seamers did the bulk of the work here in Multan, with the pace of Wood, the skill of Robertson and Anderson. Is that as rounded an England seam attack you've seen overseas for a while? It certainly um, ticked a lot of boxes, didn't it? Um, and I think the, the the best thing about it was that none of them none of them do anything that wasn't outside of their wicket taking remit, really. And what I mean by that is is something that I've kind of moaned about um, with, with with captains over the years in that. Um, because they, they had perhaps a lack of faith or a lack of um, interest in sort of keeping their spinners in the game, they would end up using their seam bowlers as um, de facto sort of uh, overfillers, if you like. So they'd, they'd end up bowling when the ball wasn't really reversing or bowling at times in the game when, when there was just nothing happening for them. And Ben Stokes just made sure that that didn't happen. So if, if it meant opening the bowling, bowling a lot of spin and waiting until the ball was a little older and, and likely to do a bit of reverse, he would do that. If it was, you know, have a couple of overs with, when the ball is brand new, get out of the attack and, and, and wait until there's a better time for you to bowling, he would do that. Um, his instinct for when to use every single component of um, his uh, his bowling attack was just so, so good. Um, mm-hmm. And so part of the reason, obviously, that is, is the skill of the bowlers themselves, because, you know, the, the, some of the dismissals in that final innings, the Anderson, um, Robinson, and then Wood um, stump car we- cartwheeling exercise was, just, was fabulous to watch. Um, so you've got all of the, the relative skills and attributes of those, of those three gentlemen. But the, the thing that made them as potent as they ended up being was the fact that they were bowling when when there was something happening for them. And the rest of the time, Stokes set them out to graze, uh, didn't put unnecessary overs in their legs, and they were fresh every time he asked them to come on and, and make a breakthrough for them. Mm. We had a few questions in about the, the high-performance review. So after this series, whatever happens in the final Test match, England will go to number three in the world. Um, and just on Robinson, he is someone who is such a product of county cricket, someone who took hundreds and hundreds of wickets in, in Division Two most of the time. And he na- and now he's um he's he's, mm. well, he's ranked number eight in the world and he's taking wickets wherever he plays. Um what do you what do you think about the the high performance review in the in the midst of another very successful England test series and that the place that stands? Is it is it almost <laughs> awkward that you've got this uh looming over the the, the test squad at the moment? Yeah, well, I suppose it. I suppose the way that they would look at it is that it isn't looming over them at all. That they sort of stand separate from it, almost in the, in in their entirety. Um, it, it, the Stokes era has made a mockery about all of the hand wringing around county cricket, and particularly the idea of reducing um, first class cricket and, and and all the other things that have, have sort of been mooted. Um, so I, I mean, I don't think it. Ha- I don't think that the review itself. Would have had any effect whatsoever on the on the test team anyhow. I think it was it was almost entirely from the point of view of 
trying to improve the production line. Um, but even that has sort of been made, as you as you quite rightly point out, slightly redundant in the fact that lots of guys sort of making their way in the in the test arena, or guys who have come back into it like Duckett, new new players like Brook, um, Will Jacks, perhaps even to a, to a slightly lesser extent. Um, Ollie Robinson, as you mentioned, have kind of come almost fresh from that and, and have been successful without anything else behind them. So, uh, yeah, it's interesting, isn't it? And it's, it's, it's one of those things because of the, the nature of, of when those these things come into play. Um, you know, after an Ashes defeat, nearly always there's a knee-jerk reaction to an Ashes defeat, although you could argue that the multiple sackings and changes in personnel at the top of the England team has been the thing that's been the most um, the, the most productive um, because the players themselves haven't changed a great deal. Mm. Um, I, I guess, you know, the, the elephant in the room with it always is that, that the 100 has made the schedule impossible. Now, the schedule was always bad anyway, and now it is appalling. Um, and <laughs> whatever needs to be done to kind of address that, uh, you know, if the 100 is here to stay, then it needs to be perhaps less blast. I, I don't... I, you know, when I when I was playing, we when I first started, there was a mixture of sort of three day and four day games where I made my debut. So you played twenty two to twenty three first class games, ridiculous. Then of course you went to, um, uh, you know, all four day cricket. So you'd play seventeen, still too many. Then with the two divisions, it go down to sixteen, and you're kind of getting getting somewhere near. Um, and I think the way it is at the moment with fourteen is about right. You know, we're living in a in a, in a country where the weather plays. An, an indecent um, part in, in cricket and, and how much of it you're allowed to play. And I think anytime you get slightly less than that, even down to 12 games, you run the risk of losing a lot of cricket to, to inclement weather mm. conditions. Uh, and therefore, players don't get to play enough of, the, of that long format. It is supposed to be the thing that we are that we are most precious about in this country. And you, you would imagine that having as little as perhaps 10 games of, of first-class cricket would not be giving those players enough um, when you consider that out of the 10 games, the amount of days that could potentially be, potentially be lost just if you have an average summer. Mm. Um, one of the players on that production line that you mentioned is, is Harry Brook. That's two hundreds in as many tests now. How good is he? Well, I, I've said it before and I will unashamedly say it again. I think he's, he's touched with a bit of genius. Um. You know, yet yet to make runs at home in England, yet to do anything outside um, the subcontinent. You would say, perhaps in his in his international career as yet, and Pakistan being a particular favourite. But come on, you know, watch a watch a guy play like that, have the range that he has, and have the the sort of almost orthodox technique that he has, and not project forward that he's going to make a lot of runs in international cricket, in which in whatever format. Um, he, he represents England for so you know I don't think it's taken a massive leap to say that he could end up being one of the great ones mm. um, and just finally I wanted to hear your opinion on something that Stoke said at the end of the game so obviously England let Pakistan into the game a little bit in that third innings the way they batted at the start of day three maybe promoting Jack to number three um, and Stoke said when explaining that that they always feel the duty to entertain even if it's not. It doesn't quite make complete sense within the framework of that particular match and the match scenario at the time. Um, what do you hmm. what do you make of that? Because not many captains, if any, have ever said that. Yeah, I, I mean, I kind of be I believe him. I, I I do think that, given how cerebral, albeit sort of um, attacking their approach has been, and there's no reason why those two things aren't compatible. I would I would imagine that perhaps a, a conversation behind closed doors about okay, but to, perhaps if we if we were playing against a team whose whose batting lineup was was a little bit less prone to collapse than that, would we have done exactly the same thing, or would we have tried to have made sure that we that we put ourselves out of sight a bit further um, with so much time left in the game? I would imagine that they would probably do that. But I think that the messaging in public, the messaging for our for our sakes, is not going to change a great deal. Mm. Um, but like I said, I'd, I'd, I'd be very surprised if that attitude came along with three days left of an Ashes Test match, and they've got the likes of Labuschagne and and Smith and hungry hungry batters who can score huge huge hundreds that you would kind of allow you you would allow um, a team a sniff of a win in a game that they really haven't deserved. 
Um, but mm. we'll see. Then maybe they will. Mm. <laughs> they made us. They made us look daft at every other turn. So, uh, <laughs> so why not? Yeah, that um, that Ashes series next summer is looking uh, increasingly more tantalising by the test. Um, anyway, cheers for your time, Butch. Catch you after the third test match. Joe asks. Can you our Joe? Not our Joe. Where no. is he? he he's be, gonna be back on Thursday. And yeah, long time. It's been a long time. On. I think it's been over a month. Um, can you throw back to the start of the summer and the captaincy discussion when everyone was reluctantly taking Stokes <laughs> as captain because of lack of any better options? I mean, I was definitely in that camp. I think I said for quite a long time, just give it broad for a summer and see how it goes. Yeah, are you telling me that <laughs> Sam Billings wouldn't have uh, wouldn't have overseen this revolution? Bill, Bill Ball, maybe? Uh, we, we definitely had a, <laughs> we definitely mentioned Moeen as a, as a test can, yeah. uh, candidate, uh, James Vince as well. Um yeah, it's definitely gone all right. Phil, it's it's eight wins from nine, and again they're they're breaking convention in a in a logical way. I thought particularly on that first morning, not allowing Pakistan to be on top despite the threat of a bra was was very clever in hindsight and passing the side. You five, can five down at lunch. Hundred and eighty for five at lunch. Hundred and eighty for five at lunch. <laughs> which which is a T score, isn't it? That's what the score should be at T. Yeah. Yeah, sorry. So what's your question? Um I, Just say some words. Just say, say some words. Say some stuff about yeah. it. Well, For the first time, it's becoming a little bit uh, repetitive, isn't it? You know, last week felt like another stage in the revolution. This this week feels like uh, just another continuation of it. Mm. You know, normal normal service continuing, really. But Uh, I guess that that is a change because there haven't been many normal wins. But now it now it's it's embedded. Mm. It's in there now. Also, there was a bit more light and shade than than there was at. Raw Pindu as as, ref, as befits the pitch and reflects the conditions that they were faced with. So there, there, there was a bit more versatility in there, I think. Um, they still went a little bit crazy in the second innings, mm. but, you know, t- two men in the top six run out. I mean, t- to be honest, with an 80-run 80, 80 lead, they shouldn't have really allowed this game to get as close as it did. That said, I can always hear it in my voice. I'm being a little bit comfortable, a bit, you know, a bit nonchalant about them winning two games in Pakistan in, in a matter of two weeks. As NASA said, you know, we're witnessing a bit of history again. and it, But it's just the latest slab of history across mm. what has been, as we know, a totally transformative nine months or so. Yeah, I, I don't want to be a party pooper, but I'm going to be. I I don't think England were that they good. Did, they didn't play great in this game. Um, no. And, you know, we'll, we'll get on to Abra Ahmed um, later. But that attack I is... mean, we should have gone in with him. How he yeah. didn't get mad in the match, by the way. <laughs> yeah, that's yeah, that's staggering. Um, but that that attack is is awful. Um, England threw away a very dominant position. Uh, Muhammad Ali offers so many hit balls. Fahim Ashraf's not really a frontline bowler. Neither is Muhammad Nawaz, and Zahid Mahmood offers you at least one four ball and over. Like th- I get the history in England not winning that much in Pakistan, but given that pitch, that should have been a routine victory. Yeah, I mean, and the opposition. It, it, it's it's amazing how quickly we've kind of become sort of uh, uh, immune to this whole thing, you know. Like, um, uh, and you're right that England were what six, seven out of ten, and 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 one. I mean, they didn't win it comfortably. It was obviously close at the end, but they uh, had their noses in front throughout. Just about, I think. Um, uh, yeah, and they 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 threw it away a bit with the bat in that third innings. Um, they bowled magnificently, especially those quicks. Uh, and that's and, and it was, it's a weird one because I think after the first innings of the game, when uh, Abraham had obviously run through England and all, all ten wickets have gone to the spinners, and you're looking at England attack thinking like so they've well they, I mean they haven't dropped a spinner but they've, their attackers has a different balance now with the three quicks they've obviously got that uh, leg spinner on the bench um, and you think have they got the right balance of the attack here especially with them batting first so then bowling last uh, is is this going to go England's way and then it still does. It's, I think it's a mark of how far England have come that uh, this is happening and uh, and we're sort of a bit sh- shrugging our, sh- our shoulders slightly. I mean, you know what, a, a win by less than 30 runs at any other point in history, you'd be talking about like one of the great test match, especially when all the scores are sort of closest together. You're almost having a brilliant Pakistan comeback really from 80 runs behind on a turning pitch to, to get that close to a win. Um, and and yet this this is now just just where where we are i mean and actually when you go through it is it is it in the top five england wins of the last nine games probably not quite you maybe put the first four of the summer and the first test 
of this series ahead of it. So it's uh, <laughs> it's somewhere down the rung, despite being a, a magnificent test match in its own right, I mm. guess. Um, Phil, there's a really interesting segment on Sky at one point where NASA was saying was trying to explain what England are trying to do. Because um, if you go back to that first day, Stokes plays a ridiculously dangerous shot a couple of balls before lunch he tries to take on the mm. deep mid on and very nearly gets caught and they were in the studio, Sky studio they were talking about like what what was he trying to do there um nasa's doing a documentary on leadership in sport and he's interviewed klopp uh david brailsford from cycling paul mcginley the golfer and a common thread in everything people from different sports are saying is the importance of eliminating fear from people's approach um nasa said himself he was a very fearful cricketer but he said that Klopp told him you shouldn't worry about mistakes because even if you try and not make mistakes you're going to make mistakes yeah and that is kind of permeating permeating through everything England are doing at the moment and it's it's just weird to see yeah I wonder if that human instinct will still nonetheless creep in to certain players at certain points in the future uh that said players who have been really struggling haven't appeared to be uh, waylaid by by self doubt. Although no doubt, when Zach Crawley does finally give the interview, probably you know if he makes another hundred, he's, he's going to give a huge interview at the end of that series. End of that series, and he may well talk about what he's really gone through in those darker internal moments. Uh, but yeah, look, we 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 fetishize captaincy in cricket, have done forever, and it's not simply because the laurels go to those individuals. It's also because of the peculiarly uh, disproportionate impact that a captain can have on a team. But then in the modern era, there is also that feeling that there's so many coaches and so much data around that a captain's Im- impact, in test cricket in particular, can be slightly subsumed underneath all of that stuff. Well, Stokes has, again... He's made a life out of it. He just keeps shifting the story around, doesn't he? Bend, bending it to his will. And what we have seen is, is the the sort of the the unbelievable power that one man's individual one man's individual vision can have on on a collective. Uh, and I'm I'm glad that increasingly it's Stokes that is spoken about rather than McCullum. Sure, they come as a pair the two of them but I think I think the more you see Stokes on the pitch the more you realise that this really is his creation mm. and McCullum has helped him ideologically he's helped him he's like you know he's he's a loyal chancellor next to the prime minister but he's the boss mm. Stokes is, is creating this thing as they go I guess there's there's a few things because it's easy to be quite like um uh talking quite broad statements about what England are doing because we've obviously we've talked about how obviously this new way has emboldened the players and it's been good, but it's not just been, you know, mindless slogging a lot of the time. There have been, t- I mean, you know, Stokes is the one player that you can actually look at and say, is he going too hard? But apart from that, there has been logic behind basically all of the wins they've done and how they've gone about them. Also, with, with even with the man management side of things, there's been an element of just telling players to to free themselves up uh, and to go out and express themselves. But there have been elements of, uh, of light and shade within that and an ability to, get the best out of players with sort of more nuanced methods. I mean, there's that story of them, of Stokes and McCullum taking Crawley out for a round of golf and finally getting him to open up over his struggles uh, over a few beers at the end. And that was, mm. that. that's not just telling him to go out and play his shots. And because, because that can also be, if if you're too sort of, uh, uh, you know, you're too stuck to that message, that could actually be something that could suffocate a player as well. If they're feeling like, well, I don't know if I'm good enough to play my shots and you're just saying, go and play your shots. That could also not be, the emboldening message you hope it is. And I think that they realise that. There's also the thing that this is kind of, in a way, this is a continuation of something that we've seen in cricket before. I mean, we've seen countless post-match press conferences where a team has lost and they'll talk about following the process and we just want to go and see if we executed our processes correctly and that sort of thing, not want to talk about the result. Uh, And that makes sense because cricket is something, probably maybe more than other sports, where you can't really control the results. Like if you're a batter, the likelihood is that any innings you play will be a failure. And if you're a bowler, the likelihood is that any ball you bowl will be a failure. So if you're, if you're not, if you're not ready to accept that, then you've got, you've got to divorce the outcome from the process. But in the past, it's always been the case that while players might have, you know, convinced themselves they're just about the process. It's still a process towards an outcome, which is winning or losing. Whereas with this England team, it really does feel like the process 
is the outcome like the process is to entertain and the outcome is to entertain and that yeah actually whether that's just that they're very very convincing in delivering the message or they really believe it and whether the case is that the players are sort of you know shutting their eyes and believing it or actually are believing it the effect is is the same that they have managed to pull that off more convincingly than any cricket team mm. ever has really and, and there's new new in their approach with the bat as well so right on crawley do you remember the uh manchester test match when mm. they beat south africa yeah crawley played a really important innings at the end of i think day one um batting in a very controlled way and it was 17 and, not out of about yeah. 90 balls or something. and that was a mass in the, at the end of the game that was a massive innings and then also uh in the second innings if you compare how Duckett batted in the first innings of this test match to the second innings he was much more controlled in the second innings the field was out and he and he, and he uh dialed down the risk quite a lot um, so same with Brooke and mm. he acknowledged that actually and because he, he got man of the match mm. slightly iffily I thought uh but he'd obviously played a stinker of a shot um, in that first innings and was big enough to say that was a shocker and, uh, and that was in his mind as he went into that second innings and so I think it's worth us bearing in mind as we do get carried away in sort of trying to deconstruct what the hell's going on that there is a little bit more uh, a little bit more nuance to it it's not immediately obvious sometimes but I think there is and I think as players those two in particular obviously as the newbies in the team as those two learn the ropes a little bit more. I think you will see that as well. You know, mm. you will see players coming up and up and down the gears. There's also just some, something else just slightly, so something stuck in my mind that Joe Root said, said to, to the magazine uh, a couple, couple of weeks ago, just, or just before the tour. Uh, and he was talking about the reverse scoop shot, which has become this sort of symbol of the era, right? You know, good old Joe doing this. And he said, the thing is, I've just brought this quote up, actually. It's just, he says, it looks complicated at the time to be seen, to be taking these so-called strange options, to be ultra-aggressive. But they're not, he says. He said, that reverse scoop, Tim Southie's bowling six, six dump to a 7-2 offside field. He knows exactly where the ball's going to be. There's no one down at deep third. There's only one way, quote, there's only one way I can get out, and that's caught by the keeper or slip. So there's very minimal risk to it. There's more risk playing a drive to a 7-2 field than there is doing that. It's safe as houses. Now, okay, you know, <laughs> he's slightly winking at me when he's saying it. And safe as houses is a good trade-off line. But, but that does tap into something. Mm. You know, there is some kind of method am amongst the madness. And when you see Stokes in the field, that's when it really, really is driven home yeah. just how much thought, is going behind this process. Yeah. I think that win, though, was, was built around the threat of the, the pace attack. Uh, Wood broke the game open uh, late on, 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 on day four. And a few people mentioned that England under Stokes have now taken 10 wickets in all 17 innings that they've taken the field. Um, wow. in Yeah. And I think there are, there are two sides to that. So one is how good the pace bowlers were in this test match, Anderson, Robinson and Wood. Then how Stokes manages them. He really saves them uh, for when there is assistance there he doesn't chuck them the ball out of desperation um ben ollie asks have we seen enough from ollie robinson to conclude that he is glenn mcgraw reincarnate um robinson now averages less than 20 for england having played half his test matches in pakistan and australia yeah i mean again it's an example of how we've been kind of accustomed to this excellence so much that we're maybe not giving it giving it the credit it deserves in these in these last two games especially when the, the story is england as a whole you can lose the individual threads as well but yeah he's been, he's been magnificent in this series and kind of magnificent ever since he came into the uh into the side it, I mean obviously there was that slight drop in Australia but he was still pretty good then despite struggling with with fitness and with lots of other stuff at that point um and he yeah, I don't, Babar twice in a test match yeah and I don't I don't think I mean from what we've seen of Ollie Robinson you know we, we've seen that he has he's very skillful he's got uh he's got the skills to to t take wickets and work out batters in English conditions and, and in Australia there's been that there was that bounce that kind of helped him but there wasn't like there was a certain amount of hope that he would be good enough in Pakistan you know there's, there was no reason to suggest that he wouldn't be but also you know he doesn't have that pace um and and on these kind of wickets that can be what you need you can be you know super super skillful and that just can't be enough and yet he has found something basically every time he's been throwing the ball I mean obviously he's been he's been used cleverly with uh with Stokes shielding his seamers to an extent I mean he bowled less in this test match than than Mark Wood and was kind of only employed when it seemed like there would be something there on offer for him but he I mean because that Babar ball was what is his first or second was it in that mm. in that um 
uh, in that first innings. Like, yeah, he's he's been a uh, he's been terrific. Yeah, he really held Robinson back, back in the match in the first Test match, but it wasn't brought on. I think it was their fifth or sixth bowler. Yeah, yeah, and the same with Anderson in the second innings as well was was held back as well. I mean, yeah, it's another evidence home thinking outside the box mm. and being quite smart, I suppose. But yeah, Ollie Robinson, I guess you're looking now at what else is there left for him to to prove in a way. I mean, it's just a question of how long can he maintain this um, and will there come a point where it drops off? But actually, I think, you know, and there's no sign that Anson is slowing, but obviously he's 40, it will come at some point and probably weren't quite sure that England had an all-conditions attack leader ready. You know, there's a lot of hope that Chris Wokes would be that guy and he hasn't quite and Ollie Robinson just kind of emerged basically fully formed uh, apart from you know, the off-field stuff, no on-field hiccups, really, and long may it continue, I suppose. He's 29, isn't he, Robinson? Did we get, do I imagine this, we got a tweet from somebody saying, do we feel like slightly missed opportunity that it's taken so long to mm. get to this point, especially when someone's so technically obviously good as he mm. is? I guess um, with him, though, he, he was a late developer. He, he, he wasn't at 21, 22. On and off the pitch as well, right? Yeah. You know, problems at Yorkshire and so on. But it wasn't as if he was tearing up the county game when he was 21, 22. Sure. But the one thing that I think England, and it's difficult because England have lots of good bowlers, but he was around the squad for about a year before he actually made his debut. And I kind of wonder, <laughs> wasn't he make, Wasn't he getting everyone out in the net? <laughs> but but that's, the, so the story goes, that's how he got into that first uh, team mm. of the summer last year. That, they all rocked up at Lords, and he was just cleaning them up for fun. And the senior players said he has to play; he has to come into this side right now. And I just want to say, just briefly on the Baba deli- delivery, the second bold delivery in the second mm. is, it did hit a crack. But if you you're a seamer, yeah, as you understand, his skill level on that particular delivery is through the roof because mm. it's it's a very very quick off cutter. Um. And you can see the way that his fingers rip down the, the right-hand side of the ball as well. Uh, and so, yeah, a bit of assistance from a from a road crack for sure. But he is angling that delivery to do that thing. Um, and it may have been accentuated by the crack, but that's the skill that he has. Mm, but I, I, I prefer the first one, actually, because uh, in that spell, that was the ball that he swung the most. And that, I think, is controlled. I think he has... Uh, he doesn't... Go, he doesn't try and swing the ball out of hope. He has so much control over how much it's swinging um, in a, a very Anderson way, actually. Um, a question for you, Ben. Which out of the two uh, Babar dismissals and the Rizwan dismissal, and two was in both things, Leach and Anderson, which which one do you think was the best ball? Uh, it's really tough. Pe- people, it's, it also depends on how you evaluate what is a good ball or not. Um, pe- people get a bit sneery about... Um, uh, dismissals that hit cracks from seamers uh, as if that's somehow like cheating or it like diminishes the skill in some way uh, when like but the quick quicks are aiming for the cracks like people did the same thing to the Stark delivery uh, to Vince remember they're saying like I can't be the ball of the century because it's hit the crack and it's like but spinners aim for the rough and if they hit the rough and it spins loads that's because of skill because they're aiming for it uh, but still for me the one was the Anderson one to, to Rizwan I think I mean it, it's less sort of dramatic in a way and that you have to almost watch it a few times to see how uh how comprehensively he's beaten in a way but um yeah that almost because it was slightly more subtle I think that was the one for me I guess mm. just on Anderson Phil I was thinking during this test match so there's a stat this back, that backs this up Anderson averages less in Asia than he does in England over the last decade which is a joke um but I think I think he's better in Asia than he is anywhere else because it's where his skill is needed the most and it shows that he, he is more skillful than basically everyone else. Because in England, conditions help everyone, whereas yeah. here, they don't really help anyone. So when he can put it uh, on the same spot every delivery and make subtle changes in, in what he's doing with the ball each time and, and he can show that he has more variations than other seamers. Totally. That actually, he, totally. he is more effective there than, than, yeah, than it, compared it, to other seamers. English conditions is, you know, they're a leveller. They're an equaliser. Uh I mean, we see it, don't we? You know, we see good, solid, honest county toilers taking hatfuls every year and having good careers. Uh, and you see decent international seamers have good times in England and they don't sniff a game elsewhere around the world. So, yeah, it absolutely stacks up, that that, that theory. Mm. Um, w- even when he is... 
not especially threatening as he can be in certain sort of second innings uh, test matches. He just doesn't go anywhere. <laughs> you know, when someone's hit, when someone hits him for four, you, you're kind of confused. There's there's a glitch in the program, and so you know he can do the he can do everything that is required. Um, he's also I watched his was it his first spell? I think it was his first spell on day four. And he was tearing in. Really tear it like he get, like he did when he was a kid. Sometimes there's a sort of there's a smoothness to his run up. Mm. Other times he really is tear, you know, attacking the crease. Um, and it must be an amazing shot in the arm to be playing under the, in this team, this unexpected Indian summer in his career. Uh, and you know he is. <laughs> well, I mean, you know, he's he's, he's ageless. He's a freak. Mm. You know, as, as we as we say, as we say every single week, he's, he's a one off. <laughs> Mm. Uh, Robinson's emergence might help Anderson Broad is obviously ticking you could see he was loving it but you know he's very much he's going to be a part of it again in a, in a couple of months time he'll probably go on that New Zealand tour you would have assumed mm. um, and the emergence of Robinson definitely helps Anderson I think because it's mm. not all on him he is a he's a you know a, a test match clone of Anderson in as much as he's threatening both sides of the bat and he doesn't go for any runs. Mm. It's a good point about the second innings thing because there had been that fear, was it what, last year that Anderson was as good as ever in the first innings, but maybe just that drop off in the second innings was the sign that he was eventually aging. And then this tour, I mean, he bowled a lot in the first innings uh, in the first game uh, and then didn't get that much rest because of how quickly England bat and mm. then takes four wickets in the second it's just uh, i know he got he, he was saved from the new ball i suppose which was a little bit of extra rest in his legs yeah but uh and and then yeah two wickets again in this game in the second innings i mean which just uh is almost it's it, it's he it does seem like he's almost fitter now than he was even like a year ago which is uh which is extraordinary and i think anderson and robinson they didn't actually bowl that much in this test match they're gonna be absolutely fine to go again um for for the third one um and just just on mark wood ben um, he he was he was really really good. I mean, we'll get to it, we'll get on it later. But Pakistan only needed sixty odd with five wickets in hand, and it was Wood that that gave England um, that shot in the arm they really needed. Yeah, and I guess that's exactly what he's in the team for. And it was it was weird actually. In a, in a way, this um, this test was this pitch was not the kind of pitch that uh, England expected when they came to Pakistan. That was more like the first test pitch, but the attack worked the way they intended it to. Yeah, uh, even though. It, it kind of it should have worked a different way like the spinners should have been more in the game because of how much it was turning and yet even though uh, i know leach took four first in his wickets and we'll, we'll come to him but even though it was kind of the pace who were the more threatening it was still the fact that they had those bowlers to bowl sort of the long spells that enabled them to come in that quick right mm. at the end of the test but yeah yeah wood is wood is is amazing and it's just you kind of just got to enjoy uh every test that you get with him i guess i mean he might play the next game or he might not and then if he does that who knows if he'll make New Zealand or England will save him for for the ashes but um yeah he's he's developing especially since he came back to the side in what in 2019 a very good record across all formats right so that's it so he's a double world champion yeah he took the wicket that won the ashes at in 2015 Trent Breed yeah. in 2015 uh he played a part in the 2019 drawn series can't remember maybe he didn't uh can't remember Anyway, no, 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 he did because no, because he, no, he was he was injured, wasn't he? he after the World Cup, the final, yes, of yeah. course, of course. Uh, but look, if he can, and he will feature at some point next summer in what is going to be hopefully a sensational five game ser series, and then he has a good chance, I think, of of completing a marvelous international career, even if he only plays forty test matches or forty five test matches and whatever it, a few few more white balls. Mm. You know, a, a cricketer like that is unique. Um, I mean, we call Anderson a physical freak. Mark was more of a physical freak. I mean, <laughs> you know, I've met him. You, you sit and have a coffee, coffee with him and you, you think he's just like your mate down the pub. He bowls it faster than anyone alive. He, he hit, what, 97.5 yeah. yeah. miles per hour in one five five something Crazy. KPH, yeah. Um, my, my favorite wicket of his, if we're doing lots of favorite wicket things, yes. uh, was the uh, was actually the Mahmood one. Uh, yeah, the first innings. No, 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 no. The second one. The second innings actually. So, all oh, right, when he cleaned him up, it just yeah, felt completely yeah. inevitable. Basically, like the end of the previous over, Salman had hit the two fours, and you're sort of thinking like, packs in the back in it. And then you think actually, they really wanted a single or a three there. It's a full over of Wood at Mahmood, and I would be absolutely shocked if he gets through <laughs> this way. It's kind of playing sort of beside the ball kind of thing, and then yeah, it just. Uh, mm. 
didn't look like he had a hope really. Um, ben, how smug were you feeling on that first morning after you predicted that Abra Ahmed would probably go quite well with his googlies attacking the England stumps? Yeah, well, um, <laughs> it seems like I'm the only one who can pick him. Uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, <laughs> it, I mean, to be fair, it didn't take. I mean, I just I'd seen a highlights video and watched yeah watched a little bit of him like that's that that was the extent of it and think that if England are going to try and hit someone someone who if you miss is definitely going to hit the stumps that was a lot of what it was I didn't expect him to be that good actually um like a, a mystery spinner you kind of think they might come in make a splash and then they might get worked out obviously there's there'll be that to an extent um and it was it was interesting he's because he, he's really uh inexperienced overall uh, he's only played four Pakistan Super League games he's obviously played only 14 first class games I think so and, and even then there won't be like that high quality footage from the Kaidia Zam trophy to allow England's analysts to sort of say this is what he's doing. And already that was happening by lunch break. You'd see they're mm. saying, you know, if his little fingers in this position, then that means it's the googly. If the ball's that bit further back, that means it's the leg spinner. Um, so there will be to an extent that people will be able to figure out what's coming. But the thing was, is that he wasn't really bowling. I know he went for quite a few runs, but only because England were really attacking him. I don't, he wasn't bowling that many loose balls on that first mm. day. And he was able to spin it both ways. He bowled a lot of googlies, but almost maybe the one that turned most was that leg break that got root LBW. Mm, and beauty. Yeah. And, and even when England were like, right, we're just going to try and play him out. Like when Stokes like was bowled past the outside edge, trying to defend his googly and it was just, it was just too good. And you, that so, might've been ball of the match. Yeah. <laughs> you, you can, you can know what's coming down, but if it's, if it's that accurate and if it's, if it's turning and, uh, and you know you've 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 got you've got enough about you and you're not bowling bad balls in between then mm. there's not a whole lot you can do I was I was he was he was amazing he was uh yeah really 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 good and beyond even uh what I expected which was which was <laughs> about <laughs> well, 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 sorry watching the, the finish with a, a bra uh giving it the long handle I think got up to 17 or 18 in the end uh he took wood for three fours and an over as well and I think at that point they needed about 35 40 and my instinct is for England, mm. but I was I was leaning to a Pakistan win, right? Because in the end, we talk about this stuff in years to come, and you 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 graft more mythology onto certain moments in cricket and so on. A Bras match on debut with all the things that Ben's just discussed, these sort of cinematic moments as well, and then for him to come out, he's clearly not much of a batter, let's be honest. <laughs> I mean, the first four he hit off, I think it was Anderson actually was, you know, wild. But anyway, if he got it, got it and just got it done and 35, mm. 40 odd, that would have been beautiful for the story, I think. And yeah. also for the series as well, Definitely. you know, it, now the dust is beginning to settle. You know, I'm pleased that England have pulled this, this thing off. But, it's a shame but at, that mo- at that moment, I was, I was leaning that way, yeah. you know, for, for the... For the shits and giggles, as yeah. they say. I thought that a lot of the discussion around him on commentary was as if he was a completely different type of bowler. They were talking about, oh, w- once England have worked out which ones are googly, that'll be it, w- which is kind of how people talk about mystery spinners in, in white ball cricket. But for a start, he's completely different to pretty much every leg spinner I've seen. He's a finger spinner, not a wrist spinner. Mm-hmm. Um, and I thought there's a bit of Ashwin in that he's got, He's just got m- much more than just two balls. And it was Broad made the point that England were actually picking him quite a lot of the time. But even when they were picking him and they knew what the delivery was supposed to do, he was still deceiving them. You know, if you think of a great off spinner like Graham Swan, for example, the batters most more times than not knew what he was trying to do, but he's still effective. And he's beating batters not just off the pitch, but through the air as well. I think, yeah, I, I think he's got a, hu- a huge future potentially. Yeah, the, the the third test, if the pitch is like this one, will be a really big test for, for Zach Crawley as well, because I think we're yet to see Zach Crawley play uh, the spinners convincingly when the track has offered some assistance. He got that one half century in India, but that was all against the, the quicks. And then the spinners came on and just dominated the rest of the test match. And while some of the England batters were out sort of trying to attack and hit Abu out of the attack and then Root and Stokes were sort of defeated by excellent balls and it was a good ball to Crawley and obviously mm-hmm. in the first over maybe there's more of the shock factor there but that was the one where you look at anything like he's trying to defend there and he's it's, it doesn't look convincing basically mm-hmm. so that that's the one thing I think that he, he acknowledges this himself mm-hmm. Crawley and, and and he's right to you know there's some physiological challenges that the bloke's got. He's massive. <laughs> and that is that is difficult if you don't have much experience playing against good quality spin bowling. And mm. uh, 
and players with lower sense of gravity, uh, center of gravity rather, <laughs> uh, such as, you know, Duckett, then you can, there's more variety, more versatility in the way that they play. And, and obviously you can get down on one knee a lot of the time. Crawley has a similar build to Hick and Hick used to stand quite tall and play down the ground against spinners. I don't, you know, you very rarely saw him sweep. So he'd stand tall. Crawley will probably, he'll have only really one way of playing against the spinners and it will have to be that if he is going to attack them, then he's going to have to try and attack them down the ground, I think, with a relatively straight bat. Uh, but again, just that, just those, those few runs he got in the first innings, some of the shots he played against, no, sorry, I'm thinking of the, the second innings of the first test, that mm. runnable 50. Some of the shots he played against the quicks. Mm. You know, he can send any delivery for four against the quicks, and that is why they play him. He's, he's probably always going to struggle against turning balls outside of England. That'll probably be a story throughout his career, I think, but that is something they're more than happy to suck up. Mm. Mm. Uh, his opening partner was brilliant again, Duckett. And it was interesting, he was talking about facing Abra at the end of day one. And saying that, firstly, that he said they didn't have much video evidence, but he actually wouldn't have wanted much. He wouldn't wanted to yeah, go I out saw there that. thinking he would like to have too many thoughts in his head, thinking like if if this happens, if that's he wants to see the ball as it comes down and plays it. And also, I guess if he is sweeping reverse sweeping so much, that's supposed to take which way it's turning out of the equation to an extent. And it's it's, it's I guess it's interesting seeing him and Brooke in the second innings with such contrasting ways of playing spin. Mm. I guess like obviously Brooke has the sweep, but he, in, in a way he feels like a more rounded player of it in that Duckett has this hyper-specific method that really, really works. Whereas Brook is like, he can come down or he can yeah. play off the back foot, he can pick the length. Uh, but I guess it's just two ways of of, of doing the of doing the same thing, I guess. D D Duckett said to Joe, the much missed Joe Harmon, just before the tour, he said, against spin, the reverse sweep is my forward defence. And when I read it, I thought, oh, do me a favour. <laughs> but he's right. <laughs> yeah. Well, certainly not just the reverse, but both sweeps, both sides. He plays 90% of his shots to a good length ball against the spinners in these conditions is a sweep of some sort. That is extraordinary. He is mm. a master of this shot. Mm. Uh, there's other things to deal with, with duck it down the line, but just in and of itself, he is phenomenal on that shot. Mm. Um, Chris asks, there is rightly a lot of discussion about how Baz and Ben have changed the mentality of the English test team. But I think the constant tactical tinkering has been every bit as impressive, even if I'm not always nerdy enough to understand all the nuances. Could you guys please try to explain for me why England look to sweep the ball so much more than Pakistan? And then a separate question on why Joe Root bowled more than Will Jacks in this game when the reverse was true. That's a really good in question. Ralph Pindi. Thanks ever for the outstanding podcast, which is always the first cricketing podcast I listen to every week um start start with the sweet one it is interesting that england have have are having so much success with a sweep but then i would say pakistan are playing england spinners pretty well um with their own method they were attacking leech pretty well through the game uh that method seems to be working for them as well uh, yeah uh i think it's it goes way back this one um it's time for some wild national generalizations <laughs> Uh, you up for that, Ben? Yeah, yeah. So, if you if you grow up in the subcontinent, then obviously you're used to facing slow bowling a lot more than you are in England and elsewhere, and in Australia as well. So the risks come into play from a very early age, okay? And you are encouraged to work a delivery that's on off stump through mid wicket, mm. uh, and that's almost a part of the constitution when you're growing up as a young lad or lass. Uh, in England. The components are different, the conditions are different, the pitches are different, the properties of the game are different. And so if you start doing that, then you get found out. And the game, you begin against quick bowling in England and seam bowling and swing bowling, and then you move slowly down towards the odd occasion when you face genuinely good spinners who can move it off the straight. Once you get to that point, that's when you think, all right, well, I need to try and find a way to score some runs. And so the English instinct is to get the sweep out because there is a perception that it's relatively safe and uh, it's kind of easier to play than employing those risks in a creative sort of fashion. Mm. When I spoke to Simon Harmer about it, he said, the English love a sweep, don't they? And he said it out the side of his mouth. Like, oh, you lot love a sweep. 
And he was talking about how it's either a boundary four or they're blocking to save their lives against him. And the insinuation was clear. If you, if you, if you come from a different cricket and culture, then there's more ways that you can engineer a, a, an innings mm. and you can, you can use those hands and so on. You can open the face a little bit more. One of the reasons why Joe Root's so brilliant is because he's got all of it. He's got the full lot. He can maneuver as well as sweep. Um, you know, you go back to Dennis Compton was a great sweeper, famous. He kind of pioneered the shot in England. No one had ever really tried it before. Gooch was a great sweeper. Gooch was a great slog sweeper. Um, there aren't too many players, though, who have been re really good for England, with maybe one or two exceptions. Thorpe was useful as a manoeuvrer of a cricket ball, but but you could name dozens and dozens off the top of your head from Pakistan, from India, from Sri Lanka and so on, but mm. you can only name a few from England. And mm. I guess because... That I was, I almost felt myself being slightly sniffy in the way that um, that you say Harmer was about Duckett playing the sweep shot. And actually, if it works, it should be fine. I guess the risk is on pitches that are a bit bouncier than this one. That's when the sweep becomes slightly riskier because you have to be like, if if you can really reach out and get close to the ball and hit it base, because it bounces, you'll be fine. But if you if if it's keeping low, then you have a bit more leeway. Whereas that's when, if you're like Brook or Root and you can pick the length, then you can. Uh, you can more reliably get on the back foot if you think you can trust it to bounce over or you can come down and hit it right as it bounces. That's when that gives you slightly more options, I suppose. But in, in some ways, it is just two ways of doing a slightly different thing, I suppose. Mm. Yeah. Good answer. And so, on, sorry, uh, on, on the leech, uh, well, sorry, on the, yeah. root, on the root jacks thing, I think this may be slightly uncomfortable to have to discuss it, but Root is possibly just a slightly better bowler than Will Jacks. At bowling. Why is it uncomfortable to talk about? Well, well just because Jacks is in the side as a... Uh, as a front line bowler, or at least as three, didn't he? Yeah, sure. <laughs> yes, <laughs> but no, yeah. I know what you're saying, but he's he's a fantasy player mm -hmm. in this side. You know? But I, but I think, it, and it's been difficult to work out from even from watching him at Surrey or from what people have been saying about him, how good people think Jack uh, Will Jacks is or how good he will be. And I think England did a, a, a just and even though he got that six from the last game, I know he got stick for saying not giving enough credit for it. But I think that they are recognising actually. Did we just as a a, a, a tiny little bit a tiny little bit just, we, we addressed it on the we are on very Wednesday fragile pod. though aren't we <laughs> yeah. just, just, just as a pure Ospin bowler Root bowled very well uh, especially this morning that mm. dismissal of Fahim Ashraf Fahim Ashraf was a really nice one and uh, England aren't afraid to they're, like they're not afraid of seniority in that way you know they'll give the new ball to 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 Ben Stokes if they think that that's the right way to go and relegate James Anderson happily and they will give the ball to Joe Root if he is the off spinner having a better day. And that's what happened in this game. And, and so maybe from that point of view, it means that Will Jacks can take it not as badly as you might another spinner in his second test match who is being relegated below the part-timer, mm. I suppose. Is, is there a little showboating element to, to some of this? Some think? of? So, some, some of Stokes's grand grandstanding. You know, Jack's at three. He'll take the new ball. Anderson bowls fifth change, whatever it is. I well, don't know. I'm just, I'm just throwing it out there because I'm tired. Yeah, yeah, I think the interesting thing on on Root versus Jack. You, sorry, I reckon people might think that elsewhere, right? If people are yeah. listening in from yeah. Australia in particular, and I keep coming back to them because they were doing this stuff a long time ago, not to this extent, but they were doing this a long time mm. ago. Eyes will be rolling, right? Don't you think? Yeah, in more, definitely. in more, you know, slightly more battle-hardened parts of the cricket well, world. We, we, the fact that we haven't really discussed just chucking Jacks at three—that was that was kind of crazy, right? Like <laughs> Jacks has never batted in the top three in his entire career, and then what fourth ball against a guy who got a seventh for in the first innings? He tries his huge slog mm. sweep, mm. Um, kind of just because they, they could. And, like <laughs> there wasn't really much more to it than that. Yeah, and 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 the latest Stokesian seminar after the game i've got some quotes here wherever we go in the world we want people to enjoy the cricket and the more we can do that and i keep saying it the more we can do that the more test cricket stops being spoken about like it's the losing form of cricket mm. because it's definitely not and he talks about the bigger picture and these are all stirring lines important lines uh but again there will be a few people down in down in melbourne you mm. know thinking all right all right wind it in wind it in a little bit yeah we were trying to go at four and over 25 years ago <laughs> i think it's and it's actually the australian players have been remarkably reserved i think about 
Baz Ball on the whole. And I think it's, it seems to really have... Uh, Steve, Steve Smith made a, a comment about it, didn't he? Did he? You know, yeah, it, it was after the one of the New Zealand test matches, I think. He said, well, you know, see how he goes against Stark and Cummins on a okay. quick one. Yeah, and, and, and South Africa is still... There will be that. South Africa is still a bit irritated by it during the summer. Like Razzie Van Der did an interview last week. Really? Uh, where, where, where he said, uh, I know they beat us 2-1 sort of by innings and nine wickets, but it didn't really work against us. Is, uh, is, then is, then is he said, said. Um, if there's anywhere in the world... Uh, that you would play like this. It is Pakistan. And then goes, I know you, your next question is going to be, why don't you guys do that against Pakistan? And that's a fair, fair point. How do you think Leach went? He passed 100 test wickets, which not that many English spinners have done. His overall record compares uh, decently against other English finger spinners of the last 35, 40 years. There's a brilliant delivery to dismiss Rizwan. But Pakistan were also fairly comfortable against him. And on the final day, especially, I thought Root was probably more threatening. Uh, yeah, I think that's all. That's all fair. Um, and it's it's strange because we sort of feel like we know what we should expect from Leach, a guy who will keep it tight. Who his 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 strength should be keeping it tight, and he might not run through teams when it is a bit more helpful. I know he's got those excellent returns when it was really spinning in in Sri Lanka and India, but he's sort of he's. I think he's not the spinner who was going to sort of defend in the first innings and then really come into the game in the second innings. If he's doing one thing more, it's defending in the first innings. And that can be fine for a team. I guess, yeah, the slight worry will be that he didn't really defend in uh, in either innings here or or in that in that first test, actually, as well. In, the, in that first innings, he also mm. got um, uh, got take. I mean, I know everyone did, but he was among those to, uh, to be quite expensive. Um, I mean, yeah. And I'm, I'm torn on whether I think England will stick with him I guess there's a few things they could do and they will mm. feel they might have a bit more freedom now that they're 2-0 up as well like do they bring in Rian Ahmed for Will Jacks considering what we've said about um, Joe Root and Will Jacks as off spinners or uh, and then would that mean Rian Ahmed batting at number seven would they see that that's something he could do do they just bat the top six to make the runs possibly or do they think let's just see if Rian Ahmed can do it as England's premier spinner that might also be something they, they do it might also be that the, the fast bowlers how they pull up sort of uh, dictates that decision mm. somewhat. So yeah, I mean, I mean, you know, and Leach wasn't wasn't awful by any means. Pakistan have, have played him quite comfortably, but as we've said, they are they have some very good players of spin, mm. and he still did take four for in the first innings and did uh, and you know bowled some excellent balls at times and got in some wickets. So, mm. Phil, do you reckon Rahan will play third Test match? I've got a feeling he might. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, I think we said it after the first game uh, that. If England do win this second one, then it does free them up to have a look at the lad. It would be very, very Stokesian to do it. Mm. So yeah, and and there's there's a legit case to be made for it. You know, Jack's had a quiet game. I can't remember exactly how many overs he bowled, but it wasn't many. I think maybe like four mm. and four and four or something like that. Um, Rahan's got a first class hundred. Yeah, Rahan's got a first class hundred. Batting him at seven is not ridiculous. No, f- for sure, for sure. Uh, so yeah, it's it's. It's possible. I'd love to see it. I think mm. we all would, really. Um, and again, because of this team, and as Stokes has said again in that longish interview he gave at the end of the game, because there is so much variety and versatility in that bowling, mm. bowling attack, and even if Rayan Ahmed only bowls a dozen overs across a whole test match, then, you know, that's all good. Mm. Everyone's happy about that. There have been shades of, of this game, not of the first game, but of uh, England series win in, in Sri Lanka at the end of 2018, like having so many bowling options that you can sort of just shuffle your attack continuously and eventually one of them will come off. Uh, they played quite dynamically with the bat in that series as well. Also just like the the, the scores as well. That was good. A, that was a 3-0 series when all the games were were quite close. And this this just felt quite a lot mm. like that, basically. Um, and and Rian Ahmed as, as a sort of an all-rounder would, would fit into that style, I guess. Mm. Um, before we go on, another plug for our recently launched limited edition pure wool cricket sweaters, which Ben is about to hold up in front of our YouTube viewers the sweater was designed by british specialist crystal knitwear who are the official supplier of wool cricket sweaters for all mcc teams um, there's only limited stock available so don't miss out on the perfect christmas gift for any cricketer this year um you know what they say at the moment as well heat the person not the room that jumper certainly does that um phil there was a shot that harry brooke played in oh, the second you don't innings even have to describe it. That made me swear very loudly at the TV, mm. but in a good way. Mm. Um, I think anyone who's watched the the highlights will, will know which which shot I'm talking about. The way he hits Mahmood through extra cover to a ball that pitched outside his leg stump in the rough. 
Um, Phil with Pope, who's played 30 odd test matches, no, 30 odd test matches now. I feel like his talent and array of shots almost burdens him. He doesn't know what to do with it sometimes. With, with Brooke, it totally liberates him. What do you mean by Pope there? I think Pope doesn't know which which shot to play. He's got so many shots that he can play. Um, he, he's yeah. I, I don't think he often knows which one to play. With with Brooke, there's a more clarity. I've, he's got all the shots as well. But there's more clarity in in, in which one to use at certain times. Yeah, possibly. Um, yeah. But I don't know. I, I kind of got ahead of myself with Brooke in this in this game. I was like, well, I mean, what, I, what I, could he what, what could he achieve? Well, well, I called him future England captain mm. last week. Um, stick by it, by the way. Mm-hmm. There's ramrod logic to, behind that one. Um, by the end of Ashes away in two two winters time, he'd have played 35 Test matches, barring injury. He's going to be in the side because he's too good not to be. Uh, and Stokes might say that's enough, mm. and then he would be the overwhelming candidate for the job. The other one would be Crawley, and then the other one would be Pope. I know who I would prefer to to run that team. He's got that alchemy of charisma, confidence, innate belief, and you see it in the way that he plays. Uh, I like the fact that he doesn't really celebrate his hundreds. You know, he knows what he's doing. He, he's He's got the sense of the stage, I think. Normally with England cricketers, especially with young batters, they're very eager to please you, you know, to demonstrate that they're good clubbable kids and all of that. Brooke seems like he just does it on his own terms. Mm. And as soon as he came into that white ball side, he just did it on his own terms. Uh, Stokes was talking him up when they were playing, I think the Northern Superchargers or whatever. And they were playing together and he said, before he played a game for England, he might have actually played one of those West Indies T20s. No, possibly. Yeah, it no, was no, even no, before no, that. Before okay. That. And he said, he's, the boy's going to go all the way in all formats. He's going to mm. go all the way. This was before he, as you say, before he played for England. He was saying it again this evening, um, as in the evening out there. <laughs> Still more than here. Um, and comparing him to Virat Kohli. So, you know... No pressure. <laughs> if, if we're getting carried away, then 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 the boss has yeah. got to have a word with himself as well. Yeah, I mean, I think we compared him on the show before as a T20 player to Surya Kumar Yadav because of uh, how he can hit, not, not just hit 360, but do it to a range of deliveries and with a certain, what seems like a lack of premeditation, he can play the shots over, over third man without scooping, which is uh, almost unique among... English batters and he's another one uh a bit like um was it was it Ben Duckett was saying that you, you can lose or or like Mark Wood like you can lose the individual narratives within the sort of the whole England thing and you can just forget how remarkable it is for a young batter to come in to test cricket and look disassured this quickly like two hundreds in a series win in in Pakistan that that's something that like if if, if that had come from a you know, for, from one of the greats of the game, that would be something that would be held up as something that was, uh, you know, really bolstering that legend. You know, if that that's that's that, that that's re- that's real proper stuff. And I'm not, you know, obviously, Brooke is not yet on, on that level, but we might well come back and look at that and being like, even at the age of 23, he made 200 in a series win in Pakistan. That that's that's remarkable. That's not something that is normal, and we should recognise that it's not that. Mm, I called I called him up for batter of the series before the series starts. Well done, Phil. It's my smug moment of the um, week. Ben, there's a big moment on the final day when Saw Shaquille, who was brilliant again, um, dismissed for 94. Oh, he, how he, unlucky is that kid as well? Mm. I mean... He's been a proper fighter back then. I heard, I heard Butch, who may well be saying it to you in a minute as well, but saying, ah, oh, just let it go, leave it be. You had them, <laughs> you had England right where you wanted them. Mm. But how many players do do that, really, when the ball is there on the, you know, outside the line and you just naturally just put, throw your hands mm. at it, you think it's a freebie. And uh, my heart really went out to the kid because, mm. he, he, as you say, he was brilliant, I thought. Um, it's a relatively controversial decision, though, because he gloves it behind the Pope, soft signals out, and after an eternity, Joel Wilson, the TV umpire, has judged it out. Do you think it was the correct decision, Ben? And do you think the soft signal is a nonsense? So there's there's quite a few things to work out here i guess that there, there, there's this thing that people discuss with like foreshortening and stuff and i think people use this quite a lot to say that basically any low catch should be out and i've said before that i kind of think that most of the those those, those low catches do actually hit, hit the ground yeah. i also think it's possible for for your fingers to be under the ball and for the ball also to be on the ground i think those two things are both possible and to me actually it does just look like it hits the ground uh, and when it comes up you can see there's a finger on Pope's glove that has some strapping on it. Uh, and you can see that's the one that's kind of under the ball as he comes up with it. But you can also see 
uh, on the slow-mo, but that's kind of pushed out to the side at one point as the ball is on the ground. So I personally think that it hit the ground, but there was also quite a lot of weird stuff being said about the soft, soft, soft signal as well, I think on the commentary and then quite a lot on social media and even on some websites, they were saying that the, the protocol around the soft signal has changed, that now it's only only applies when the technology is uh, is unavailable. And apart from that, the TV umpire just comes to his own decision. And this is one of those, I mean, I've said this before, but if you think that there is something that is in the rules, you'll be able to go and find it in the rules. Like the rules are all available and they wouldn't have just made a change and no one would have reported on it. And there are no news websites saying that this has happened. No news saying it's happened and it's not in the playing edition, so it hasn't happened. Mm. Like this, this is not a rule change that's happened, but everyone has just sort of convinced themselves that it has and then thinks, oh, well, but this must be the way because everyone's been saying it. And it's like, no, well, you I can see website might not have updated itself. I went on there a few a few days ago to, and they hadn't updated their rankings for, for yeah. ages, for weeks and weeks and weeks. We're, they're, they're generally more on the playing editions and also it says updated November 2022 on the, uh, okay. on the playing edition. So yeah, mm. I think I think they're, they're fine with this one. Um, uh, and soft signals in general, I'm kind of okay with them. I think that, and I think that this decision, although I think that it did bounce, I can also see how it's a marginal one. And in those cases maybe you do just want to like it It could go either way and maybe you just want to stick with hmm. what someone sees in their first instance there you want to leave that with the with the umpire so i'm broadly fine with it M- maybe i'd be in favor of taking it away for outfield catches where the on-field the umpire miles uh, away from yeah it. can't yeah. really see it and that's what the mca recommended but the mca are also generally happy with soft signal overall and i don't think this catch is any less controversial either way if there is or isn't a soft signal i guess it just gives hmm. people a target if if he gives it out then you're going to have Pakistan fans being very angry. And if you're not out, you're going to have England fans saying, why are you calling mm. Pope a cheat? You look like you fall shortening, whatever. So it's a, yeah. um, It wasn't a great game for the umpires. There's one brilliant bit where Aleem Dar and Joel Wilson were publicly disagreeing with each other uh, during a review. That was great. Was and, and also because you could only hear Joel Wilson's side of it. So you could just see <laughs> Aleem Dar's expression. Did you see this, Phil? No. On the first morning. So it was... Um, uh, LBW. So yeah, that was it. Duck it. it, it yeah. So duck it was, uh, was given... Out. Out LBW. That's right. Yeah. And he uh, he went to, so, and he was sweeping it. And uh, and then there was a, a spike as the ball was right next to the bat. So Joel Wilson says, uh, he says, you can go back to the on-field umpire, Ali, you're going to have to overturn your decision. And then you hear, no, the spike is next to the bat sort of thing. Yeah, the spike's next to the bat. He's like, okay, I'll look at it again. And then he goes back and looks at it again. He's like, yes, the bat is next to the ground. So the thing is, it looks like bat hit ground. Sure, and yeah, yeah. Ball is next to bat at the same time. So bat hit ground, but ball is next to bat and there's a spike. So we're going to do it. And then Alim does face he's forced to overturn it. He was not that happy with it. Yeah. And there, there were four overturned decisions on that on that first morning. I think mm. Abra Ahmed was a... Uh, Fooling everyone, not just the <laughs> batters. And there's a there's a funny moment with Babra Azam and Maria Erasmus. Oh yeah, that's great. I presume you won't have seen the the memes of this film. <laughs> uh, just uh, it was on the TV cameras in the in the first test when it was just where Babar happened to be standing with Murray behind him. It basically just looks like babar has got a very big belly. Right. It's, it's, it's quite puerile, but quite funny. Um, <laughs> and then in the second test, uh, there was a I can't remember which fielder it was that sort of threw the ball in, and Murray had to sort of like move out of the way, show some quite quick movements, get out of the mm. way actually. And so they're having a bit of a chuckle and then Babar just goes and uh, stands next to Maria Erasmus to uh, to recreate the thing from the first test, <laughs> which is nice. stuff, yeah. yeah. Lovely. He's your favourite umpire, isn't he, Phil? By miles. By miles, <laughs> he's incapable of a bad moment. Even when he gets wrong decisions, they're still right in my eyes. Um, and, and just just finally on, on Pakistan, um, did they get their team selection right? Of the two test matches, I still don't know what Salman Aga does. Um, Mohammed Nawaz and Fahim Ashraf are neither top six batters. He played nicely fun. in the first test, didn't he? God. He made a nice nice 50 in the second innings. Yeah, yeah but, 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 but what's his role in the team, I think, is the is the odd thing. I, I So it was weird because I kind of, I quite like a lot of those players. I, I, I think that Salman Aga looked quite good. I think Fahim Ashraf often makes quite a big impact. Uh, Mohammed Nawaz is also sort of quite a, you know, but he's quite a canny bowler and is a useful batter. But you looked at the team when they picked it, it's like they've somehow feels like they've got less batters and less bowlers than they did in that first test. And and how has that happened? I mean, mm. they still have left Hassan Ali and Mohammed Abbas. Uh, I mean, they're not even in the squad, but there's no reason why they couldn't just call them up and they haven't done that. And Mohammed Ali does not look like he, a, he must be better than this. Yes. To, to yes. average 24 the ball of first class yeah. cricket, yeah. but he is not bowled well. Yeah. Um. So there's that. There's all, I mean, it was also Rami's Raja who, I, I mean, there might be other things he's doing in Pakistan cricket, but lots of things he's saying to the media, I don't think can be very helpful to the team. Just, just, and I said it on the pod last week, but the 
the impression it gives officers of the Pakistan are just so cowed by all these teams that come and just instantly feel like, oh, this this team is amazing. Let's just be like them. And it's like, just just pick a way of playing and do it. And he's now saying that we've seen how England are playing. It's amazing. So I'm going to tell Babar to pick all the T20 players and do that, which one is not what England have done. <laughs> this is not a team mm. that is that similar to their T20 lineup. And also, who are the T20 players he wants to pick? Maybe Shadab Khan, fine. Uh, I don't think Asif Ali is going to come in and transform this test batting lineup around. You can say Shah Massoud, but you're not picking Shah Massoud because he's a T20 player. You're picking him because he's a, a very good, consistent Red Bull batter. Um, and they've already picked the, lot- the fast bowlers based on T20 form. Like right. Harris Ralph came straight in based off T20 form. Mohamed Wasim in the squad based on T20 form. Yeah, and they already play T20 cricket like it's test cricket as well. Yeah. So. <laughs> anyway uh, that is all we have time for today cheers Phil cheers Ben Um, thanks for listening folks we'll be back on Thursday for a pod on all the other cricket that's been happening in the world over the last seven days